All right, I think uh, we can get started. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, and uh, welcome to the, today's uh, CC May Distinguished Speaker Seminar Series. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest speaker, Professor Paula Montero. Professor Montero is a renowned researcher in the field of material science and engineering. He is a professor uh, uh, in, uh, of civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, in more than 25 years of study, research and teaching at UC Berkeley, Professor Montero has developed, uh, devoted his career to advancing the science and technology of concrete. He is committed to developing multidisciplinary integrated research that expands uh, the knowledge and application of innovative, sustainable cementitious materials. He has uh, authored over 300 technical papers and uh, has received numerous awards and honors for his work. He's uh, also a fellow at the NEAE, uh, the National Academy of Engineering. And today, Professor Monteiro will be sharing uh, his insights on the use of synchrotron X-ray probes to study the multi-structure of concrete. So I'm sure it's gonna be highly informative um, and engaging seminar. And we are thrilled to have uh, Professor Montero here with us to share his expertise. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor uh, Paolo Montero here. Well, well, thank you so much. It was a very kind introduction. Well, I am the pressure. First visit to MIT, and you know what reputation you have, right? So it's just as tough as it can be. I, you know, I'm guilty as charged, been watching sometimes the Big Bang Theory in itself, MIT, Caltech, and never, not once Berkeley was mentioned. So, you know, I'm developing this inferiority complex, but so I, I will try my best to justify the presence here. And it's becoming standard for and I do apologize for people who are in the field of concrete, it becomes almost a symbolic way to show a graph how important concrete is becoming. So it's basically, and there's different ways of showing uh, the importance. I just want, I you, you like the work you do it, you're always biased. So, uh, and the reason why I like it, because people would say, oh, people are using more uh, cement and concrete because there are more people. And that is true, no question about that. But what about if we normalize the consumption per inhabitant? And then, then we start seeing a little bit, nothing like putting a little bit of perspective. You see that wood consumption is pretty much flat all the time, uh, it's still somewhat flat and then starts to increase. It increased from uh, last 65 years about three times. And here comes concrete. It's one order of magnitude from 65 years per person. Again, it's not because the total population is increasing, but when you multiply, and by the way, this is cement. If you multiply by seven, that's what the consumption of concrete so would be putting in a log scale almost. And then you, you, the impact is not as dramatic. I should have put a big arrow going all the way to the top. And there are consequences on this. I really want to emphasize that the big problem with concrete is not so much of the embodied carbon, but it's how much we use. It's tremendous. And so what would be the impact? This number changes, uh, people can call seven to eight, 10 percent, but it's really bad for many reasons because the other areas, let's say our competition in, in being the villains of the bad guys, they are decreasing. They are being much more efficient. We are using more material and uh, percentage-wise, this number would increase. So in other words, we are really on borrow time. People know it. Um, this is basically, what do you say, four gigatons. Huh. 
it's difficult going to say, what is it? It's a lot. Giga sounds a lot, yes. But how bad it is uh, if uh, this industry, just the cement, not even the concrete, if you detach and put as a country, would be the third worst uh, polluter in the world, just after China, US, and cement. So, I mean, nothing to brag about it, but so we, you know, we pay for this, and we try, so this become a really important topic in itself. It's, uh, when I started my career a long time ago, it, this, it was a no sell. You couldn't, it was, I mean, to me, I would never expect that uh, in my lifetime I would see this. I think about my poor advisor, who was a pioneer in many of this, and nobody paid any attention to this. Only now people are revisiting uh, the process. And so we have to go it. Uh, when I did it, I promise I prepared these slides last week, and now we have a bank fail. So you know, maybe I should have changed, but I was not creative enough. So you know, the whole concept is it's too big to fail. Because the argument that the concrete industry would basically say, almost in an arrogant way, I say, OK. And then so what? What are you going to be doing it? And well, w one time, probably very soon, the government will say, well, what do you have to do? You have to pay for it. You have to have a cost associated with this. At the moment, reality, it's no cost. You can have some incentives, but we are really getting away with murder in many ways. So we are getting away with murder, that is true. But changes are coming, and big changes will be coming very, very soon. And industry is feeling the heat. I mean, that's the other thing. It was just people are knocking down at your door and said, you have an idea. Uh, last Friday, I received uh, an email, somewhat urgent, from Caution uh, um, Ventures to basically say they want to discuss yet another startup and they want to have some advice in the process. I have two of my students abandoning tenure track positions um, just to, not just, maybe, who, who am I to say? It would be the same thing of somebody of Bill Gates that say, you know, the, the person didn't finish. Who am I to say? They maybe become the billionaires of the future. So the two of them, one is the, CEO, another one is in the advisory board, different startups, so they're kind of competing among each other. Nobody knows who would come with the killer process. A colleague of mine te uh, who already had tenure in geophysics abandoned Berkeley uh, to be the CEO of a startup. So it's the type of thing that you, know, you hear about this in electrical engineering, that's not so unusual, but in our field, at least my field, it's not. So the pressure is building up intensively on this. So I would like to give a little bit now, taking back my own perspective uh, on, it is a wild process. People are claiming every time some new ways of finding it. So you have calcine clays, limestone, and by the way, all of them are good options. Uh, but you have geopolymers coming, modified Portland cements, carbonated cement. Uh, for my own full disclosure, I also work in startup companies. And for a while, I thought that I was going to be a, a Ferrari guy. It was, I thought it was really, for those of you who ever work in startup, I can give you my own personal take. You know, these ups and downs that you get it. You're top of the world. Next day, you're nothing. Uh, and then top of the world. And this was very close to IPO. And then somebody discovered that the finances were not properly computed. So I don't know, I think I had 100,000 shares, which doesn't really mean anything. Uh, we have Roman concrete, variations of Roman concrete, or alternative supplementary materials, and I could continue this. This is not the topic of research, but just say, when you have so many alternatives, it indicates that uh, we need a more permanent solution on this. And the fact is, even let's say you find the perfect cement, cheap in the labs, durable, and in the labs you have to be careful on this. How are you gonna be testing on this process? Portland cement has 150 years uh, 
of research, ups and downs, good research, not so good, building codes, some failures. We cannot wait. Even if you find the perfect cement, I would guarantee Portland cement for at least the next decade would be running parallel because you know, you're not gonna put the new cement in a bridge or even in your house and have a collapse, which did happen in calcium aluminate cement. So we have history for this. And for me, I was this, again, my own uh, personal take. It became clear, and also because my advisor convinced me that since this time, about here, uh, things were changing very dramatically on this. So we have to find new ways of testing uh, cement. Uh, it cannot wait this very long process. So I decided to, about this time, to start doing something different and not like I have been lucky. Uh, on this, I was doing um, cryo studies for cementitious materials. Uh, and many of the professors that were working on that mentioned, well, there is a new uh, synchrotron facility in Berkeley. You know, if you're lucky, you're lucky. You know, the advantage is to take advantage of your luck. Uh, and we uh, did our very first experiments uh, three years later uh, when basically there's nothing there inside. And I have to admit, nowadays, you write a proposal to a synchrotron, and I, if any of you would ever want to use a synchrotron facility, I'll be more than help, uh, happy to help you out writing the proposal, because now it's easy, because you say, I want to solve the carbon footprint of concrete. You know, keep going, you're already almost there. But imagine the first time, you know, this costs, at that time, close to $200 million. That's big money uh, at that time. And, he, and, I did, and I said, well, I went to study the hydration of cement. And, you know, the top physicists would think that I would plug all the big lines. So, you know, you have to go a lot of education. So we have to go with baby steps nowadays. And I think that's... Our group is the longest continuous user of the facility in itself. So our approach, we start with baby steps, okay? First one big line, and then of course my, uh, the director of the synchrotron facility was smart enough and said, you are not fooling me, I know what you're doing. And then we move to the next big line, like okay, what can we try that? So this is just a short list of the big lines, we've done it, and it continues. But this looks like a shopping list. You don't care for to, my lecturers to start, we did this and they removed this and then we did that. That's boring and it's not the way it worked in reality. So let's forget about this. But I do like this kind of Napoleonic baby steps because you, know, you just go expanding little by little, uh, learning from the mistakes and move. So I would say, I was, when I was preparing this lecture here, I said, well, you know exactly what was my thinking process? What would be my wishes? Because I didn't want to have all these big lines. I was not even familiar with many of them. I said, well, what do I really want? Okay, so imagine you have three wishes granted. Uh, one of them, I would like to have very high resolution imaging. The best you could do was scanning a lateral microscopy, which was wonderful but it dries out the material. And that's the reason why I was using low temperature microscopy to kind of freeze very, very fast without affecting. But I like to ca uh, capture kinetics at the time. So I thought, well, this would be something that I like very much. And then to identify the crystals that are forming. And finally, what would be the mechanical properties of these new crystals? Everything with a resolution appropriate to the phenomenon on this. And uh, fortunately, fortunately, however you want to see it, everything happens at the nanoscale. All the activity, well, it happens in all scale, but the one that I really want to take care of it would be uh, these processes. And let's start moving uh, how it goes, and nothing like being lucky. No, you, you have to admit, sometimes you have a good idea, but your path is not the best one, and nothing happens. And at that time, in 1993, one of the top beam lines was this uh, microscope that looks very simple in terms of the geometry, is the um, X-ray microscope. 
And you say, well, what's the, what's the advantage of that? Well, the physics is rather complicated, but the nice thing about soft x-rays, it doesn't require quantum mechanics. And as a matter of fact, in 1938, a very famous uh, researcher um, in Germany wrote a book on soft x-ray imaging, putting all the equations. But could you imagine putting all your book and in the final chapter, conclusions, beautiful theory, it's a waste of time. <laughs> and, I'll, and indeed, I'll tell you why. Because, you know, and the equations were perfectly fine. What was the big challenge? You have to focus these x-rays and use with uh, Fresnel lens. And the special resolution is given by the distance between these rings. So if you want to say, we started in a humble way with 80 nanometers, nanometers, you have to manufacture this. In 1930, that was impossible. I mean, they could not even envision that would be possible to do it. So imagine the physicists solving all the theory, proving that it was a real concept, could be done in principle, but not in real life. And that was the end of his career on this, moved to something else. And, but the equations were there. And they say nothing like being lucky, that you, you have the production of the microscope and why people are interested for bio, biology in itself. You have cells and you want the kinetics. So here we go. Uh, we start using uh, this microscope. Um, one aspect that I like to do in kinetics, meaning I want to have my reactions underwater. Right. You put cement mixed with water, and you look in the scanning in an optical microscope, you don't see much, but you see maybe a little bit of like a fuzzy ball coming out of it, and the water is not relevant because water is transparent, visible light. Life is easy. You move to a different frequencies, light uh, of the energy itself, the water is no longer transparent. Um, and again, on the lucky side, um, physicists knew about it, so they study. And biologists said, well, there is this great opportunity of resonances that, let's say, in the order of 200 to 500, you have this water window, that water becomes transparent. And uh, kind of biology is kind of nice. It's complex, but at the same time, what elements do they have? Oh, they have calcium, uh, nitrogen. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put calcium here, but it's, uh, carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen. And this is uh, sulfur here in the low end. You could have potassium or whatever, but it's very simple chemistry. But you see, you have all these resonances. And I, I, just to show how naive I was at the time, I said, I don't care about carbon. Well, it turns out that carbon for us, and now that you study carbonates, well, it turns out that's a gold mine. So I went back and I said, what was noise for us? It's really real data. So I have to go back, step back. So we could start seeing it. And this is, we are so proud of this. And people always hurt your feelings because here is the very first image of a cement. This is water. And as time passed by, you see the little uh, fuzzy, material that you start seeing the first precipitation here, formation in the matrix. Oh, come on. More and more. So we start seeing the kinetics in real time for that. I'm like, wow, this um, uh, Kim Curtis, who is now a professor in Georgia Tech, was here. We worked together because I, I didn't believe that we are going to get real data. And I was feeling very guilty that maybe I'm advising her in doing something, really wasting her time. And so we would press, it would take almost five minutes, it was out of focus, and do it again. You know, it was tedious. I know her life more than anybody else. Because, okay, Kim, what are you gonna be doing over the weekend? Oh, gonna watch a movie. Oh, okay, we got the image, out of focus, okay, poof. And then eventually got to the process. Uh, to, but you, you see how much you can do it? Oh, all in a sudden, it's a new game. 
And I showed this very proud to the director of the center and said, oh, you know, you, you seem like a proud father of a baby that only father or mother could love because he said this little fibers here with no appreciation. I keep telling, this is real gold because we can study every type of reactions like we've done it. We study in situ, pozzolanic reaction, which is relevant for Roman concrete, the solution for gel polymers, kinetics of calcium hydroxide, retarding and accelerating admixtures. Many of them actually were sponsored by companies. Uh, for instance, this formation of gel was sponsored by Lafarge. They did not understand why some of the cements that they had it had a rheology problem. The finger would get stuck. And we showed to them in real time that there was a gel forming around the cement that would coagulate the whole particles. And for the calcium aluminate cement, so, okay, so life was looking pretty good. Um, but you always get greedy, right? I mean, you make a wish, and your wish is never good enough, right? Everybody had this experience. Whatever satisfy you one week, uh, you play for a while, and then you say, well, could we do better? Of course, that's our game, right? Otherwise, it's no fun. We don't want to keep repeating with different materials. We want to increase uh, the magnification. Um, that turned out to be more challenging. <clears throat> Remember when I mentioned that classically, that the German scientists want to use this Fresno uh, rings that will give this. Oh, by the way, David uh, Edwards, the senior, um, it's a really personal friend. After you know, we after work close to thirty plus years together, um, he wrote this. In, what's it? Nature? If, yeah, it was Nature. A big deal, major breakthrough. That our original resolution was in the fifties, fifty nanometers, and he published this paper. In, uh, which was in 2005, indicating that uh, resolution would be much better. Uh, but it didn't. It started entering diminishing returns. So uh, another year, nothing, no changes. Almost a decade later, they were approached 12. So they couldn't publish in Nature. Nature said, forget it, you're not going to do this because uh, just the whole process became so fragile. You got these own plates, just the vibration of the air would be enough to break it. There was not enough stability. So it seemed that we'd be stuck on this, and there was a frustration. Uh, but everything was so with a major breakthrough. And talking about inverse problem, so if you want a really challenge inverse problem, this is the one with a major breakthrough. Uh, so the concept actually is quite elegant. Uh, they use the concept that was developed in optics over 100 years ago. And they're trying to do the inverse problem of what they call the phase problem. You have amplitude and you have phase. Like classical x-rays, you measure the amplitude, but the phase is unknown. And they try to solve this inverse problem, the whole system, had no constraint, would blow to pieces, and nothing would work. And then somebody said, ah, oh, what about if we look one image, take a photograph, get an image, digital image, and move a little bit to the right, to the left, doesn't make a difference, create a grid, and it will be an intersection. So the moment you start having intersection, you make to the left, make to the right, and the intersect should match when you start moving. It's Fourier spaces to the to the nth degree. So it was really complicated. And you do this and you create the whole map. How long would that take? Let's say we were one of the pioneers, just because nobody went to waste their time and said, OK, I'm ready. It took us uh, 17 hours to make the measurement. Huh? See how much time? When I say we, I put the student, we rotate a little bit. Uh, and the reconstruction took close to a week. You know, that's for LBL, so a really fast computer. It worked. Now, and now it's a standard process. You can get the image in 10 seconds, uh, and the reconstruction is as good as immediate, doing all parallel computing itself. So all in a sudden, you start studying 
the inside of the hydration on a cement grain. So for us, it's really a big deal. What you used to see, you, you can really do all types of mathematical morphology. You can see the spacing. If you are into Fourier transform, you can play with Fourier transform and obtain the small angle scattering. So you can see, well, questions that people could, it's kind of frustrating for a lot of people, you could create so many models, but nobody could verify in the lab. All in a sudden, say, wait a second, we go inside and outside, that's what we call inner product and outer product. And it's thought, oh yes, there is a big difference. People say, oh, big deal. Uh, we knew there was a difference, but all in a sudden, say, oh, but it's just a second, it's more, it's not there is a difference, we quantify the difference. And we can, so something that friends would be always interested in, can we modify this? And indeed, we wrote proposals later on. What about if you start putting polymers? Would the polymeric system modify? The answer, yes, it modifies. So it opens up a line of re lines of research that you could do it, but in the past, you put polymers and you go to the testing machine and you break. And you see a difference, but you start saying, is it really internal or maybe it introduced air voids? Or in, uh, here we are making all the analysis at the nanoscale level. Uh, what's the resolution? Oh, that's the type of thing. I love mathematicians. You can never pin them down because it's an inverse problem and they wave their hands, even though they you're gonna say you're waving your hands just to annoy them a little bit. And they get very annoyed, very, mathematicians are very, uh, because it depends a lot on the quality of the inversion. So they, it's, so how good is it in the order of five to six uh, nanometers. So it's really a big change. So anyway, uh, we have the inner product, outer product. I could go, if you're in, in cement science, you could spend quite a bit of time. It's not the place here. But the message takeaway is that we can really analyze the inside. Um, so what about the next stage? We got everything in 2D. Can we obtain the same aspect in 3D? You know, we always try to move up. And this turned out to be really complex because it's a limited angle tomography. It's an inverse problem. And also, it's will pose because it's a missing angle problem. We rotate minus 80 to 80. So there will be this cone. Uh, that's unknown. So for you to get the information and misalignment, you're talking about nanometers. And so that was really complicated. But um, we, let's see if the video, yes, I do have video. I forgot that I had the video here. I mentioned that, okay, let's see if. So we can play, I, I haven't published this, but oh, come on. It's not that I'm hiding. Come on, go, go, go. It's supposed to show the cross sections. Let's see if I do manually. Oh, did I crash the system? No. It's, I have something running. OK, well, I, you have to use your imagination on this. But the fact is that we can basically cut in all directions, uh, do really precise analysis. And uh, I have no idea why. I hope I, I can continue my presentation without problems. So much fun. Well, actually, it's the revenge of, uh, I'm the chair of a search committee. And last week, <laughs> I said, this, there was one candidate, oh dear father, she has cold. And uh, don't worry, I will either take it off. But she was so cool under pressure because she decided to visit web pages and videos within the web page. And sure enough, the whole thing crashed. <laughs> and you think that should be, you know, my job, frankly, is not really on the line, but her job was, oh, you see, Let's it woke back. up. Let's go back. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get it. Oh, no, I eventually, yes. Okay, we go here. And, try again, 
No, no try again. I know you know you should select your battles, and uh, it's not worth it. But anyway, it's a good story for her. I put so many points for her. You know, everything that could go wrong, but she really asked for prop. You know the type of thing you don't go instead of getting the video in your computer and put it in like a link or whatever I do, even so there is a risk. Not only that, she move. Oh, okay, web page, what is it again? There, oh, pfft, the whole thing explodes. So, and I was so impressed, and no, it's my time. So, anyway, uh, here's the story. We can really go and apply to real cases. There was this theory that nanocrystals or atrinites and mineral coat a given cement, and that's the reason why uh, the concrete doesn't harden immediately. Um, so, uh, we, oh, this we did at APS. Um, let me show you. So this would be the blue. Take a look only on the blue. It is the core. And here will be the crystals. And we move to the next one. Cross section sometimes is much better. You see these areas. There are areas that are fully exposed. So you, the coverage is not uniform. So we just indicated that um, the claim of this arrow for instance, the water can penetrate here without any problem. So the argument that there is a continuous layer of these nanocrystals is not correct. We did at very high resolution cross sections, nothing like this would go. So we are in good shape with the quality of imaging in itself. You, and nowadays, what used to be cutting edge, when we start doing it, you can go in Berkeley. You write three-page proposal, very simple. You can go to APS, Stanford. Uh, I used to go to Bessie in Germany on a regular basis. But nowadays, whatever you have in mind, so for your Roman concrete, if you want to do it, or any other, if somebody has a new cement, you can certainly use it. Oh, let me, let me go back, oh, if I can. Maybe I can't. Oh, let me just, I was just going to, Oh, thank you. So one thing, so the image side we nail. I think we are, at this stage, as good as you get for quite a bit of time. But I claimed, you say, I say it's etringite because of the chemical balance. But somebody said, oh, I don't believe you. Oh, and, oh, and, and believe me, I went through the review process. You know, the nightmare that after a while you already know the typical comments you get back. How can you be 100% sure that etringite and non a metal uh, product that unstable? And wow, okay, so you know how uh, reviewers can be? And I'm equally tough at the part. So you know, against the karma, you give and you receive. And, and it's a valid point. Truly, it's a valid point. So there is no chemical information. And so here comes our second wish. We want to structure information on this. And it turns out, then I run out of my beginner's luck. I have to do it. Um, the argument that if you want to do it, you do yourself. I was very fortunate. It's the type of thing you receive. I received for almost a day, almost like 15 years. Uh, I was a user, got it, all the benefits. Uh, after that, I got a really large uh, grant, multi-million dollars. So I said, OK. They were surprised. What about if you create a big line dedicated for cement to find the characterization process? So. And after this big experience, I can tell you, being a user is much more fun. Because you go there, you're not responsible for anything, do the job and go away. Here, you have to be on top of things all the time. But this is a technique that gives you spectroscopy in real time and gives you, uh, so it's called a spectral microscope, gives spatial resolution and Zane, so you can go. So now there is no discussion anymore. Provided, and that's what we dedicated close to a decade. There is, like, you, you want to do your Raman, or even XRD, there is a database. You know, you press the keyboards, do a Google search, and off comes with the pics. There was nothing like this for cementation material. So we now publish and publish much more to help somebody else. 
as well, because now we create a database, so I claim that close to 90% or more, uh, you, it's everything available, and it's, now it's become easy. You go to a given spot, the quality of the image is not as good, by the way. Uh, that's one of the compromises. But you can go to any spot, and you can create your maps, but with resolution of about 30 nanometers. So you can create maps, or you can do a point, if you want to do something fast and easy, the system is uniform, give you the full spectral analysis in great detail. So all in a sudden, we, uh, people have been doing that in soil chemistry, but uh, it was nearly impossible to get any of the beam lines. So now we have this dedicated beam line in Berkeley, if anybody wants to use, it will be very much welcome. So going back to the original deal, remember when, uh, how sure you are, this Etringite? We did the full spectroscopy, came up with a model, oh, I should, sorry, um, for some reason my reference we published a couple of years ago in Langmuir, we basically prove what is the mechanism of retardation if you have this process. So all in a sudden, things are moving uh, fairly well. So we can get the chemistry. Remember this image that I did, high resolution tachography? If you want to study calcium, where is the calcium hydroxide is, so for Admir who really want to study the presence of nanocrystals, we can see that. Or if you want to put polymeric material because you want to interact, or for 3D printing, that's a classical example, more and more people are putting special chemical mixtures. We got a grant from Dow Chemical for fibers that you have to change the surface, uh, the functional groups of some of their fibers. We got that. So you know, all of a sudden, we can do things in a quantitative way that you couldn't do before. OK. And off we go. So you create these maps. So life is not so bad. Just a short parenthesis on this. Since I was invited by Admir, I thought I have to put something on Roman concrete. Otherwise, I would never going to be invited back again. <laughs> so it is something what we have been doing in a little bit more traditional. You do your classical XRD, but we can do maps. The bulk uh, X-ray diffraction gives you the bulk. OK, you have this, you have that, the shopping list, but you do not know the spatial resolution where each one of the crystals are. So we can do that without any problem. Uh, we study uh, Roman concrete form all over the place. This is from Romacons. It's, isn't it a fun project in itself? So people in archaeology, I'm really looking with greedy eyes. Uh, I know the people who went there. They were archaeologists. Uh, they started this project when they were in the late 50s, never had any experience in their life, underwater training. They took courses in scuba diving and extracting concrete, got quite a bit of money for the Tau Cimenti to go all over Italy in the Mediterranean collecting sample. Not a bad gig, huh? So I'm still trying to they need a phase two. Uh, so this is my own, it's fun. For me, it's a personal job of samples. So I'm a beggar. And so, uh, John, I was looking for you with greedy eyes, uh, maybe with your connections. Which one do you think I'm missing? No, Pompeii, I got it easy. I got so easy, the Pompeii. The Pompeii turned out to be Pompeii. I mean, you never know. Uh, the Pantheon, yes. Oh, for those of you working with Italian, I have my Italian passports because of my background. But working with archaeologists, it, well, maybe I shouldn't say that, not in public or that. Otherwise, ne I'm never going to get my sample. But yeah, you know, it is difficult. It's the type of thing you get a no, it's the beginning of a conversation. You know, the first no that I got, it's okay, that's the end of it, you got a no. And they're like, what, what's wrong with you? No, they expect, okay, what about this and that and that? And maybe two years later, we got the sample. So this has been my collection of babies that we've been studying. Eventually, I'd like to compile everything in a, in a book, but not for engineers. I mean, engineers can read, but just to the general public, because I think that would be such a nice way of attracting people 
to the science and engineering and the history of art. So it's really nice. So, but the, the Pantheon, oh, I did get, maybe I should tell the story. I managed to go, that was my best story. I, it's not part here. I managed to go to the Pantheon in the middle of COVID, at the end of COVID, empty on the 21st of April. So what's so special about the 21st of April? that I got the permission. My wife never forgave me for doing that because I got her so, so quick. I have to go, I have to go. And got the permission from the present university to go because it's still the end of COVID. Got spent a huge amount of money, got a no COVID flight. So what's so special on 21st? Oh, we have somebody from archeology, span no? It's the foundation of Rome. And what happens at the foundation of Rome and the Pantheon was designed such as the solar circle would go making the, the routes and at precise uh, noon uh, when the doors open, the emperor would enter. So it would be the same thing, all the symbol, that's what the type of thing attracts me. The whole symbolism, imagine like the Hollywood laser beams that you have it, that was the emperor entering and it matches to perfection and there was nobody there. Um, how did I get it? Friends of a friends of a network, and I was waiting until three days uh, before, and then the university didn't want me to go, and then I said, but I have this. So I always bluffed a little bit to some, maybe, you know, to the chancellor, who it's really wonderful. And I got from the office of the chancellor the official permission to go there, but I got the official letter, and why is that again? Because my friend of a friend uh, is the best retor uh, restorer of, um, of Rome, work with top, uh, well, who is that, Umberto Eco, and he asked, and once he asked, I received two days later the invitation. So, you know, you have to get once in a lifetime, I took, except that it was raining the, the day before. I called my mom and said, please pray as much as you can, because uh, nobody would ever let me forget that I, I may manage to go COVID with the letters, and then I have to explain the chancellor want to have a copy of the, my beautiful photograph, my time lapse going. I have somewhere if anybody wants to see it. Sure enough, for a window of four hours, blue sky, like, oh, yes. And so it does work. So I need the Pantheon, John, with your connections. <laughs> now, we are, you know, just for people start thinking oh, this thing would never end, uh, we start getting to the last phase. One thing that's not, it's what's missing. We know how to image in real time. We can identify what it is. What's missing is that, what is the mechanical properties of the crystals? Uh, that is difficult to do it because they are pretty small, amazingly small. So how do you measure the properties? In this case, I don't claim any original thinking. Uh, it was just the mechanical properties at the nanoscale, atomic scale, sorry. Uh, it is something that people are using for a long time in geophysics. So it's nothing, uh, but it was, to my knowledge, the first application for civil engineering related to cementitious material. You put a little piece of your known crystals. It could be Etringite. We, well, we use all the collections on this. Um, nice uh, diamond to have very flat contact, very hard, and put a median. So you basically do a testing machine. You get the bulk modulus in itself. And how do you get it? Uh, it's a very simple, when you think about it, it's a very simple process uh, because you apply the pressure and you measure the volume change. Um, so when you think about it, it's, it's a little bit more complicated because it involves large deformation, so you have to take second order term, but that's no, it's not that relevant. So this is the type of work that we done it uh, to extension on this. So you have pressure, volume, and you get the bulk modulus. So it, to me, it turned out to be so much fun because the number of molecular dynamics model that people done it was huge. And some of the results matched, some of them did not match. So all in a sudden, we could come and people came and complained to me about my experimental results. And I said, I don't, you have to handle that. I, you create this model, probably your John's potential is completely off. 
you get your act together, modify, because this is the same thing somebody go and complain about experimental results. So with the atrium guide, calcium hydroxide, tabermorite, aluminum tabermorite, which is for the Roman concrete, oh, gel polymer stuff, uh, gel polymer, oh, and our baby, which we done to extension, calcium silicate hydrates to perfection, and including adding shear, the shear experiments were my favorite because we proved that the crystal, nanocrystals orient, they rotate, which uh, I'm not presenting results because I will have to spend a lot of time to this. Uh, and my final uh, pitch on mechanical properties using synchrotron is this. This is truly what people are interested in nowadays with synchrotron for tomography. Large, a large scale. So people uh, who want to study carbonation, or carbon sequestration, create a cell like this. Uh, if you are in soil mechanics and you want to study the percolation of a fluid as time goes by, you create a gradient here. Uh, if you want to see oxygen absorption, so anyway, you, you can create whatever you want. I'm using uh, a lot for well, I mean, many things, including Roman concrete, but as, as a hobby, but we have done, you can do compression, bending, and tension. It's kind of really, I like to take my undergrad students there because it feels like a real scientist. You see wires coming all over the place, not that relevant, but still, uh, it looks like. Uh, so here, I just gonna share with you something that hasn't yet been published. Uh, we got, this is from, uh, oh, that's an interesting, this is, this is one is from the, it's not the cloaca. This is from Caracalla Baths. I got from the cloaca. The cloaca is, was also an interesting project. We went down there, got it. Um, but look at all the amount of strain. Can you see how much the, this Roman concrete really can absorb strain to a point that it is inconceivable. It's yeah, the strength is this is unusual, it's being so high, but so we can basically see the crack propagation you can do in 3D. Um, and just to show you a little bit, uh, that it's not kind of show and tell. The big challenge then is to quantify everything. So, a lot of people just show you know, it's easy to provide a video of the cracks propagating and you wave your hands. Uh, much more interesting because you can quantify is to use computer vision such that my student who just graduated last year, I thought I would have a nice academic life. Nope, Google got him with a huge salary for the, you know, what they call this glasses, 3D glasses, because it's computer vision itself. It said, well, you know, all the software that I develop to image cracks and edges and everything else I'm using, for, for the Google. And once you do the segmentation, you do quantification analysis, one, one difficult uh, challenge that was sponsored by ARPA-E with lots of fiber reinforcement. And the fiber is not metallic fibers, it's polymeric. So to, to find the contrast, it was complicated. But um, if any of you took, oh, all right, there we go. If you, if you have done a, your fiber pullout that people do sketches and things like that, that's the really first time that people can record the mechanism of fiber reinforcement. Again, without even any, of course, you can give your assessment of the images, but images are there. And some of them looks like really from the textbook. You'll see the fiber either being stretched, some of them would be branching out with the cracks so, or towards the end of it. So you really can study fundamental aspect of crack propagation. Uh, in this case, it was intention. And you, you can really go and you know, do whatever process. Uh, we don't have torsion that, but in principle, you could do torsion. Um, we did a lot of bending and pure tension. It worked amazingly well. And so this is also oh, the, oh, so that was one of this very classical uh, textbook example that got, you know, it turns out that it was not. So intellectually, whoever proposed the model, many people 
have done similar work uh, were quite correct. But now we can validate some other areas, not so much. The, it's slipping, and we have, you see the fibers so, and the orientation of the fibers. That could be a potential problem for people doing 3D uh, printing of concrete. You see how the fibers can align themselves. So this could be a potential problem. So I, I just want to finalize my lecture to go back. This is a cartoon. Real life genie do not exist, and there is no limit for three riches. So you can really go. There are many other techniques that are really exciting. You can do ramen, and we have done some ramen. On this, you can do um, what do we call pair distribution. So you can see for glassy materials, we have done it, what the correlation that you had. It. So you can put as many fingers you feel like. The opportunities are humongously big. So the second part is that I emphasize a lot of the work that we've done, the advanced light source. But uh, we also went quite a bit in Chicago, close to Chicago, Argo National Lab. Uh, in Germany, Italy, uh, this is in Brazil, a new one, one of the most uh, advanced at the moment. Thailand, so the advantage is that it is free. You can travel, if you like to travel, uh, and many of these places, particularly even in Germany, they give you money if you, sh if you show that, well, sorry to tell you, coming from MIT and Berkeley, that doesn't really fly that well. They always assume that you know, coming from a top university, you should have, your advisor should have money, but in principle, there is nothing. If your advisor would say, well, you know, whatever reason we don't have money for this project, it's interesting, they, it's not uncommon, they even pay their ticket and everything else. And I just want to finish. The, the amazing thing is that this is a partial list. When you start working with synchrotron, there are so many people involved that we start moving and moving and moving. And I thank you so much for your attention. If anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to to address that. Thank you very much. A beautiful uh, picture on uh, how we approach cement chemistry and the structure. Oh, thank you. Questions? Yes, William. I have a bunch of questions. But sure. I'll ask one. Yes. Um, with respect to the mechanical properties of a material like concrete, um, the, the morphology is extremely important. You spoke with this a little bit just before uh, in the talk, too. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with needle-like things that can enter mesh, then you have uh, an appropriate measurement would be shear modulus and not the shear behavior, not tensile or compressive, like you would get compressive volume change. Uh, so I'm wondering you know, if there are ways that you can do this. What would be very nice is to look at the microstructure, the micromorphological structure, and then identify, of course, what, what the chemistry is, and then look at a different kind of measurement other than just the volume change measurement. Yes, I'm uh, glad you asked, because we've done that. We, we haven't planned we yet. The problem with the synchrotron experiment is that you generate so much data and analyzing them. So at APS, so for your shear, what we do it is this biaxial compression here, and you change the vertical load. So when you do the principal stresses, you have, I mean, when you do it, so you have shear, and you pass x-rays. So we are, uh, we measure that. And interesting enough, going back to your process, uh, if you compress in all direction, pressure, uh, the nanocrystals are happy the way go. They, I mean, they compress, but they do not rotate. The moment you have shear, they start rotating, and we are measuring everything with x-rays. So you, it's to, to me, it's my most interesting type of research, 
because we are proposing that a lot of these mechanisms, like in real life, you do have quite a bit of creep associated with this. We don't claim that it is the only mechanism, but certainly at some of the work that France and, and other people put on this, but you know, without uh, kind of the mental picture for this, which makes sense, but here we have the quantification of the rotation of the nanocrystal. So we are doing exactly the shear, and we can play with the level of shear. So we keep this constant, we start increasing here, increasing the shear, increasing the shear, and we start seeing the rotation more and more. Well, it seems that it's not a traditional crack opening mode. Uh, it's a shear, it could be a shear mode, and to try to pick that up and relate it to the crack propagation in these systems, it seems to be really very valuable. Um, you're absolutely correct on this. Uh, uh, that was our project. Uh, remember that cell that you have it? We had proposal for a very large company uh, for shales and putting everything, including torsion. Uh, it was a multi-million dollar and everything went fine until the moment the university and the top agent uh, company was signing and that's when the oil price for shales went down so that's the first time that I managed you know, like having this mood change in a week that I you know having a couple million dollars one week nothing two weeks later without any warning except that basically the top administration said okay let's put a hold in anything until see if the the price will go up Needless to say, the price went up, but nobody contacted me. So, but we have the design for this cell. So you're absolutely correct. We have, and not only that, we also plan to use like with hydraulic fracturing on top of things. So we could combine this and do real fracture experiment, simulating hydraulic fracture, everything in situ on this. But you know, sometimes the sponsors do not co collaborate. But anyway, I was happy that in the long term for everybody that the oil price went down. But um, we have to wait until we can build that cell. But other people can, in other systems, I suppose somebody already has a cell. It's nothing. The sales cost about $100,000, so for the overall investment, I'm sure that if somebody looks carefully on this. Um, there, were, there was one in, um, in France that we did do sheer torsion for a Roman concrete. Uh, we haven't published yet, just because, again, that's the ultimate nightmare. You come out <laughs> with <laughs> terabytes and terabytes and terabytes. So the, um, and then uh, the, the student graduate, they're like, no, uh, you know, and then it's, okay, this is your terabytes uh, for somebody else, and, well, somebody else. I do a few of them, but, you know, just don't have the energy to. I'll keep them, so they're cr creeping themselves, who knows, but, but yes, your point is extremely well, well taken. Uh, yes? Uh, thank you very much. This, this is a fascinating uh, problem. Um, the, uh, at the engineering measure level, mm -hmm. next to the macro, uh, <coughs> multi-axial mm -hmm. crack propagation right. has been well studied, mm -hmm. understood with respect to aggregates, mm -hmm. size, and so forth. But the um, stress strain curve that you showed for the Roman concrete, mm -hmm. I assume that was for mortar. Uh, uh, macro level, level? It's an interesting deal because I see your point, and it, when you, we have done both. Uh, so we, exactly to to prevent done. Oh, you haven't. Oh, I thought that was the question because okay, then I wait for that because this one I can handle. Let's see. You. <laughs> Let's see the next one. Okay. Um, so it, it was at a, a, a reduced level, uh, micro level, or even nano level. The very interesting thing that you showed there, the crack propagation and its contribution to the. Uh, the formation behavior, right? In fact, crack formation is useful because it gives a tremendous ductility to the problem. Correct. So my question is, at, at the micro or nano level, uh, formation of those cracks, what is the basis of it? Is it like mostly interface cracks or is it going through the crystals? 
What Correct. is the mechanism? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I will be happy to that, qualify more of that. Because that, that is really connected greatly to what the macro level Absolutely. is going to be. And we could perhaps explore the Roman concrete in that direction. The, uh, amazingly enough, the Roman concrete, no matter what you do it, has a ductility that is significant. Even uh, we, uh, thanks again to, to the Cloaca Maxima, they, oh, and why do they have this? Because of the subway system, um, there, is a, uh, there was a uh, new line uh, that passes very close to the Colosseum, uh, Line C, and um, they were very much afraid uh, what would happen uh, when they start digging everything, you know, with the Colosseum bent or whatever. So they have done a huge amount of coring, including passing through the concrete. So I have big chunks. And so with this stress strain diagram for, I'd say real, I don't know, maybe what, two inches, Okay, it's, it's still a core, and the, 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 it's really huge. Now, the crack, it's really interfacial cracks most of the time. So it goes along the interface and then continues in the matrix. So they, it always go, it's, to me it's a little bit, I'm gonna say strange, because the aggregate they use is very porous. Why the crack doesn't really continue in something that is very porous to me. It's somewhat strange. But of course, there is a pozzolanic reaction. So you know you can wave your hand. But still, the aggregates are very, very porous. So it's some of them. Uh, you look at the porosity, it looks higher than in the matrix. But the cracks, no matter what, deflect and then get arrested. And then they grow on the other side and happily doing whatever they decided to go. And you might say, well, it's a scaling effect, so that's why I'm very sensitive to do at a higher level uh, if I have more. Um, so, but you know, trying to get there, it was very intense. I, I think that uh, it's a good friend of mine, but I think she had tears in her eyes when she gave me a piece. And, and I said, can I get another one? Not my baby, no, come back. So we have this. Truly, and I understand, for them, it's something of great value, and so it's for us. So we have to be very careful. So we're trying to do it in the multi-scale as much as you can. If somebody would say, well, do you have 10 or 20? And I say, I wish. Uh, we don't. Yeah, but, uh, if I may, just the interface, sorry. Uh, you also show that there is like some sort of fibers that are deviating uh, cracks and, and, uh, and the kind of uh, no, 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 we, it, it's really impressive how much the material can take uh, toughness and deformation. That's, uh, even though we have the images, we still said, well, okay, we have the images here, like somebody showed a photograph, and, but why it's able to deform so much? And we have uh, done very precise quantification as well in terms of imaging correlation functions. So we know exactly where the crack grows and everything else, but what's missing, so I mean, we have the quantification and everything else, but the why the material is, the material is, it's deformable. So it's, it's not your classical matrix that you have it. So. It, Right, so the strength, uh, that's one thing that, this, what's the limitation of the Roman concrete? The strength, it's low. So it, it is a soft material. Yeah, so you can pick this up on something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we can, we cannot generalize, but it's interesting that that Mount Fedexio failure behavior that we observe at the engineering as a level seems to be repeating itself <coughs> at the nano level obviously with a huge difference in the, in the scale. Exactly, yes. You know, we did some uh, molecular dynamics analysis. Mm -hmm. and we found out that it's true for the application of the more coulomb theory it's to, right. uh, to, to hold at the, uh, at the nano level. So it's interesting. It, 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 it is. We, we are learning a lot. So the Roman concrete to me turned out to be, which I started truly as a hobby because I was having so much fun on that, but all in a sudden, it's a material that becomes a model material and for, in terms of chemistry, 
it is the type of thing you can never duplicate in the lab. So. What, what makes it, I mean, what, what makes the wrong concrete to be so durable over the centuries in your view? Well, I mean, in reality, it's still the explanation is it's over design. <laughs> If you do the analysis, it's really significant of design. No steel, so there is no corrosion on that, so needless to say. Uh, the idea of a soft material, it's really good. So the work that people in architecture, in block, is doing this, in, um, like you done as well. So the whole concept of, uh, quote, softer material for some applications and the way they design it. So it's a combination of design, uh, how much they actually knew. Uh, well, they, um, sh they have failures as well. I mean, what we're seeing is survival bias because a lot of the structures that collapsed, and many of them did collapse, um, we, 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 we do not know, but the ones that survived, it's, so, uh, so to some degree, that's why to me the Pantheon would be particularly good to do some of these tests and try to see, people do not know even the mechanical properties, or I've seen some of the models that people are doing a finite element. Uh, some of the assumptions are questionable in terms of the shrinkage. Uh, it's a little bit, they're assuming uniform shrinkage that you know it's, um, yeah, you read a few times the paper because you think that you, you miss something and then after reading you realize, oh, the assumptions are very harsh. And so, anyway, there's still a lot to be learned. Yeah, uh, if I may continue. So, so in your opinion, self-healing is part of uh, a chemical self-healing? Yes, we, we are in the process. You beat us to the punch. We, were, <laughs> we have lots of data, which I didn't, uh, I didn't show here because you know, I promised x-rays, I didn't want, but we have the gamma rays, neutrons, and x-rays, and we do see the healing. So the healing is, uh, uh, is present, certainly for marine concrete, we know for sure. What is still, how the healing happens is so still, is the that, that is concrete? still, that's why we are holding back a little yeah, bit yeah. if somebody comes up uh, on, yes. Please. If I could make a, a comment on Roman concrete that is really good. So, um, one of the great things about NHU, which is throughout the Mediterranean, is they don't get a lot of free star cycles. And the place to really look at durability is something like Hadrian's Wall, where they do, and where structures, in fact, have not survived so well. Ah. And I, I think that's something always to remember, that the Romans had beginner's luck, too, because they happened to be in the right part of the world. <laughs> Now that you mentioned, so, you know, when you start having this, you, you in being mild obsessive, you're always trying to find, let's say, uh, I have a PhD student who just graduated, my postdoc now, and I said, wouldn't it be nice, he was studying ice formation, he said, wouldn't it be nice for you to study the behavior of ice uh, or formation on the Roman concrete, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, more than 50% of them fail. Uh, interesting enough, the ones that did not fail, many of them are the very poorest one. Uh, for obvious reason, uh, there is enough uh, place and absolutely correct. And this, the, and finally, it, there's this urban legend that the Romans used blood. Uh, we couldn't find any evidence for, you reading books uh, that, uh, and it, believe me, it makes perfect sense if you have done it, uh, because blood uh, does incorporate air in training, and we have a lot of uh, work on that, but um, so far, zero evidence of the presence of a stable air void. They do have pores, but never a system that would accommodate air in training. So you're absolutely, I agree 100%. Good, I think uh, we are beyond the time. Yes, well, <laughs> well, thanks for the patience. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you.